We are here at UCLA, and it's a beautiful day, <laughs> on October 6th to hear some extemporaneous speeches. Specifically, we're first going to address the question, should the feds raise interest rates in the near future? Okay, hi, my name is Madison Bachran, and Hi, uh, Madison. Hi, Madison. Like our teacher said, I'm going to answer the question, should the feds raise interest rates in the near future? I want to start off by saying maybe a little bit about what Stay the in the power is. stance. Uh, maybe what the Fed is and how interest rates relate, because not everyone may know what that means. Let's say, for example, the Fed is like a teacher, and its student is the United States economy. The Fed grades its student throughout the year and eventually has to decide if the Fed will pass the class or not. I mean, if the economy will pass the class or not. If the Fed determines the economy is strong enough and healthy enough to handle the uncertainties and obstacles that come with passing the class, they will raise interest rates. If they deem the economy unfit to do so, they'll keep interest rates low. Uh, I also want to start by saying how this pertains to all of you because it actually is a really important issue and affects each and one of you greatly. Most of us are going to be soon to be college grads and we're thinking about applying for a job or maybe buying a car or a home and paying off student loans. And with an increase in interest rates, that makes all those things much more difficult for each one of us. The three main reasons why I think the Fed should not raise interest rates in the near future is first off, consumer spending is good for economic growth. Second off, the international economy, economy is not healthy enough or strong enough to handle handle raise in interest rates. And third, and finally, unemployment is still not at target rates. The first reason why I think the Fed should not raise interest rates is because consumer spending is good for economic growth in the United States. Uh, basically, when the interest rates are low, people are in a borrowing or spending mindset. So people are more likely to go out and spend on goods and services and to meet the demands of consumers. Workers or companies hire more workers, therefore more people get paid, therefore there are more consumers in the economy who raise demands and the cycle continues of uh, more goods and services being produced and more high people being hired, which is a really good thing. But when interest rates are high, it's a saving mindset. People are, are more likely to save their money because it's more lucrative, they get more returns. So then uh, people don't spend as much on goods and services, the demand goes down, and people get laid off. And unemployment raises. So uh, I think a really good point by uh, Carl Russell of the New York Times, uh, he notices that the biggest borrower in our whole economy is the United States government. And if interest raise, rates do raise, in the new future, they'll be the ones most affected. So things that they do like public services, like fixing roads or building schools, will be greatly affected. And overall, it'll really hurt our economy if the government can't spend money. The second reason why I think the Fed should keep interest rates low at this time is that the international economy is pretty unstable for a various amount of reasons. Uh, some include that China's economy right now is on the downturn. They just devalued their currency. Also, global stock markets are also in a slump. Oil prices are going down. A host of reasons make the economy really unstable at this time. Again, like I said, when interest rates are low, people have a borrowing or spending mindset, and that includes other countries. So they'll be more likely to buy our products and we'll be able to export more, increasing the global economy and our own economy here in the United States. But if we raise interest rates, again, that's a saving mindset, so people are less likely to purchase our goods and services, decreasing not only our economy, but the growth of the international economy as well. Uh, the Federal Reserve officials stated on September 17th, recent global economic and financial developments may restrain economic activity somewhat and are likely to put further downward pressure on inflation in the near term. Basically, the Fed made a statement saying, now it's not a great time to lower interest rates. The third and final reason why I think the Fed shouldn't raise interest rates at this time is because of the unemployment rate. Although it is significantly better than in the 2008 recession, it's still not at ideal rates. I think when people look at the uh, percentage on its own, they don't understand that unemployment rates don't include people who have just stopped searching for a job in general. 
those people are called discouraged workers and they're not included. And the recession lasted so long and was so severe that the amount of discouraged workers has really increased and there's no way to measure that or know that exact number. So even though unemployment rates have gone down and that's excellent, I still do not think that they meet target levels that to make our economy strong enough to be able to handle an increase in interest rates. Again, when interest rates are low, people are more likely to borrow and spend money, which means more people are buying goods, the demand for goods goes up, and to fulfill that demand, companies have to hire more workers and page higher wage rates, which again, increases our economy and uh, increases growth altogether. Again, I wanna reiterate the importance this has to each one of you, because we are about to graduate, we're thinking about paying off student loans, looking for jobs, maybe buying a car, or maybe a house if we're lucky, or an apartment even, and all those things will be like greatly, greatly affected if interest rates go up. So it's really important that we keep in mind that this does have great effects on us, even though it kind of seems far off in the distance in the government that we have no say. Again, I want to reiterate my three main reasons for thinking that the Fed should in fact keep interest rates low is because, uh, first off, uh, consumer spending is good for the economy. Secondly, the international market is in no means necessary to handle an increase in interest rates. And third and finally, unemployment uh, is still not at ideal rates. I want to finish by saying uh, what Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bank Bernanke said in August, of, even after unemployment drops below 6.5%, and so long as inflation remains well behaved, the Fed can be patient and seek an assurance that the labor market is sufficiently strong before considering any increase in its target for the federal funds rate. Which means at this time, even the Fed isn't so confident that raising the interest rates is the best thing at this time. We have the uh, luxury of being patient and really making sure that the labor market and our economy is strong enough to handle these interest rates. So we might as well just wait until we're very confident before we make any further action. Thank you. Thank you. Stay up there for your feedback now. That was 641, Madison. Okay, we'll start over here. What did you like? Stand up, say your name, and say what you liked about her speech. Hi, my name's Charlie. Hi, Hi Charlie. Hi. Um, a couple things that I liked. I liked um, the part of the uh, outline, the, the uh, tie back and the conclusion. Those two were very strong for me because um, for a seven minute speech, you know, there's a lot of facts that come out, and you know, you hear them once, but they don't really solidify until you bring them back. And I thought you really did a good job of reiterating those, making sure that we were very certain, solid on that. Um, one thing I like, I think I just liked your general tone. It was very like happy and pleasant, even though some of the things you're saying were like a little disheartening. But uh, you kept an optimistic tone throughout, so I liked that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charlie. And how, what would you like to see her do differently that would make her speech more effective next time? <laughs> okay. Um, Hi, Klaus and Jeremy. Hi, Hi Jeremy. Jeremy. Um, I guess something you could maybe do differently is, uh, though I like that it was really concrete when you tied everything back in, um, you are kind of like spoon-feeding the crowd, which in a way was like, uh, um, I could appreciate that because it made your points really obvious, but at the same time, I think that it would have strengthened your speech if you didn't have to say, you know, to tie everything back together and you just maybe tied things back together. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Jeremy. Madison. Thank you for going first. Thank you for breaking the ice. Now, let me give you some feedback and tell you what I'd like you to do to make this a little bit more elegant. And really, these comments are directed more toward you out there because it's too late for Madison, but not too late for the rest of you because your speech is in the can, shall we say, right? Um, we want to have an introduction that's a grabber, a poem, a quote, a story, a joke, or even a rhetorical question. What would you call your introduction? Um, I, I use a metaphor. You use a metaphor or an analogy, right? Yeah. And so that was fine. What I want you to do is start on your metaphor or analogy, then work your way, which leads us to the situation in the economy today that's so tight, 
which leads us to ask and answer the question, should the feds raise the interest rates to the in the near future? In the near future? And then you say, my answer is no. And I'm going to prove this to you in three ways. I'm going to tell you that it's one, two, three. And yes, I disagree a little bit with Jeremy. I think that in, especially in economic topics where people tend to zone out a little when you start getting too numbery or too abstract, that uh, you, you have to do a little bit more spoon-feeding in the economic topics to make them interesting and keep your audience uh, with you, right? On your thesis, it was well done, just with your voice, make it just a little bit uh, shorter, a little, a little wordy, so cut it down to one, two, three. You took your significance, uh, you had your significant statement in there, it was a little bit out of order, and, but you had your significant statement in there and you sold it to them. And I noticed that you, sold, you kept bringing it back to the audience, and I liked that. Because that's one of my mantras, remember, it's always about the audience and giving them something, and communicating to them, helping them understand. So I like the way you're saying, now this is important to you guys, you've got student loans and, and so that was uh, excellent, Madison. On your main body, uh, help to keep unemployment at a minimum. Remember, and I'm going to stress this, when you cite a source, when you cited the New York Times, you didn't say the year. Oh, it's and this year. What? I should have said this year. Even if it's this year, Even I can't if it's, say September 17th. What am I, psychic? No, no. Oh, you're right, you're right. right. No. I thought I was just implied since it's... Since no, and you want to, it's not, we know you're a great researcher and everything is recent, but it helps to build the credibility and... November of 2015, the New York Times concluded, or Ben Branicki said in November of 15 that, or October of 15 that, so give the date that helps give it credibility. I thought your three reasons were solid. The China thing could have been a little bit more documented, but you didn't have a lot more time to do this. Um, on the uh, increased borrowing, your third response, um, your third argument that was good. Uh, I like the way at the end of that you went back to this, gave, gave it significance, and I think that, that helped. The summary was good. The conclusion, remember to restate the thesis. And if you want to, one good thing that a lot of them, um, if you watch some of the other extemp speeches on there, one of the things that some of the extempers do is, and so that's the first reason the Fed should not raise interest rates in the future. But let me give you a second reason the Fed should not raise the interest rates in the future. I've given you two, but there's a third reason the Fed should not raise. So every one of your reasons is hammering at your single argument, your thesis, see? Okay. So I would uh, do that kind of thing to really make your argument that much more powerful and strong. You restated your thesis and you tied back to your intro into your metaphor and that's what you want to do. You want to go back to that in the end. Also, I like your thing about the, what did you call them, the people that have given up, the stop searchers, the oh, discouraged workers. Yeah, that was good. Let me say one thing to all of you about economic mm -hmm. topics. They're real tough to do, so when you choose them, just be aware of the fact that you've got an extra special challenge to make it work as opposed to talking about uh, genocide in Africa or something, you know, where you've got dead bodies and real pathos and real ugly stuff that you can really talk about in a really, you know, in a hairy way. But this, Economic topics can tend to get dry, so be aware of that when choosing them, unless you're an econ major and you think you can really make them sing and shine. Overall, you did a nice job. Thank you. Thank you for going first. Can I take it home and then type it up for you? No, I keep it. You oh, you need to have this? Uh, no, I, I have mine.
remember the speech. I'll rewrite it. Thank you. Do we have another volunteer? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Do you have an outline? Yeah. Great. Give me a moment to put her speech away. While he's putting his topic on the board, were there any, are there any econ majors in the house? Was Madison full of uh, bumblebee? Uh, what did she miss? Help her, help us out in Latin. I mean, it was Share something with her. It was kind of simplified, which is, I guess, what you're going to expect. We have to do, yeah. Um, I general tendency stand up, con class, on again. Um, I think the general tendency now is they're going to start raising interest rates. So the argument, I'm not sure if I were, I probably would argue that they should raise interest rates because that's what the Fed's probably going to do anyhow. Oh really? Uh, when? Because it depends on a lot of things, but but um, mm -hmm. one of the arguments is that is that in case of a, the interest rates are basically at zero, so they can't go any lower, and yeah. if there's another problem, another economic crisis or whatever, mm -hmm. there are no more tools. There's no more yeah. tools, yeah. So, and they've been doing what they call OMOs, so open market operations. Um, I'm not sure if that's interesting, but and they've been doing that for a really long time, and you have to kind of lean the economy off of it sooner or later, and it's been a while. So, your prediction, your opinion is they're going to raise it soon. And you sh you're, you're saying she should have waffled a little on her opinion. Let's hear from, thank you. Let's hear from another econ oh. major that could offer something helpful to her analysis. That was you. You said you're an econ major, I know, right? I don't know, but I don't know what she did good. I don't <laughs> she did well. She did well. I don't disagree with her. I, I wouldn't want the, it's a question, I think it's an open-ended question that anyone who's just, who wants interest rate stuff, I don't know why, but we don't, so, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I asked him pointedly how he knew they were going to be going up, because I, I've been hearing students in my class say they're going up for two years, so I'm a little cynical about hearing they're going up any day now. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they will, but they, sure they will. the question but, is, should we say no. It's yeah. going to. Okay. Will it? Yes. Should it? No. Okay. Okay. The camera is running and we have Cody before us to address the question, will Hillary Clinton's email scandal play a major role in the Democratic primary? Oh, you're tall. Just a moment. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever heard that one. Sorry about that. Well, you're taller than Madison. Okay. Okay, Cody stands before us, managing attention, communicate. Stay toward the back of the green square, please. Not, no, no, in the green square, but toward the back of it, yeah. 
communicating respect, saying to himself non-verbally, I respect my audience, making sure no one's writing, the telephones are all away, no computers are open, everyone's looking up. Say your name, feel the love, <laughs> start your speech. Hey guys, my name is Cody Kime. Hi Cody. 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 I want to start today off really quick by asking you a question. What are you guys looking for in a leader? Is it somebody who's progressive and sees the problems we're facing today and wants to move forward? Is it somebody who's strong and is stand going to stand up against our adversaries? Or is it somebody who's honest? Somebody, when they make a mistake, is willing to admit to that mistake and try to fix it. I want to talk about one of Hillary Clinton's mistakes, this email scandal. I was asked that if, is this a email scandal going to come back to haunt her in the upcoming Democratic primaries? And my answer for that question is no. There are multiple other things that the Democratic Party is going to be looking at when they're trying to determine who should they put forward in the upcoming 2016 bid. As we watch the upcoming primaries, I want you guys to very, pay very much attention to what the Democrats do. Because the decision they make will not only affect our lives here on this campus, but will ultimately, ultimately affect the direction this nation's going to go. My first, my first issue is the fact that the Democrats need to put forward somebody who can stand up against the Republican giants. In order to do this, they need somebody who not only has experience, but has name recognition. Hillary Clinton appears to have that name recognition as former U.S. Sec uh, Senator, Secretary of State, and First Lady. Currently, according to CNN, with this name recognition, she has been able to earn over $75 million already, when in July she only raised $45 million. That's a $30 million jump in just a matter of three months. That's very significant. Also, according to Politico and Huffington Post, she commands a 20% lead over her second place contender, uh, Bernie Sanders and Vice President Joe Biden. At this point in time, Hillary Clinton is the only individual that is able to stand up against the Republican bigwigs. The second point that I want to talk about that they need to keep in mind is keeping face with their voter base. If they, unlike the Republican Party, who has set, put forth 20 candidates, 20 plus candidates, to debate over their issues, at the same time constantly destroying one another's character, the, the Democrats have put forth only a very few candidates, using this time to narrow their policy agendas and determining what their next strategy will be. If they follow suit with what the Republicans did by bringing up this scandal, not only are they going to be providing ammunition for the Republicans to use against the current administration in the future, but they're going to separate their entire voter base. That's what the Republicans have done, and that's what the de Democrats will do <coughs> if they bring up the scandal. And my third, oh, do you, and my third and final point that is going to play a more significant role in the emails versus the email scandal is Hillary Clinton's experience and failure in her role as Secretary of State and her way of overly politicizing controversial issues such as gay marriage. When she's competing against somebody like Bernie Sanders, who historically has always followed, followed his true convictions, regardless of whether it's popular or not, Hillary Clinton simply can't compete. In 2000, in the year 2000, she was quoted as saying that marriage is basically simply between a man and a woman, as it always has been and as it always will be. Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, did not agree with that. He's always support, supported things like gay marriage. However, now that it's suddenly becoming the popular thing, Hillary Clinton has gone a complete 360 and has decided to support gay marriage because that is the in thing at the moment. So, I don't think that her email scandal, although she had a minor lapse in judgment, <coughs> is going to play a significant of a role as somebody who changes their ideas, their internal convictions, based on what may be in and what may be out at the time. That is what her major problem is going to be in the upcoming elections. However, you know, Hillary Clinton still commands a significant lead amongst her uh, fellow contenders for the Democratic bid. Uh, she, despite all of that, she still does not have a guarantee at achieving the nomination. There are other factors that Democrats will play, and they will not, absolutely will not use the email scandal against her, because that in the end will backfire. Uh, 
overall, um, I hope that you guys, after hearing some of this brief information, have made a decision as to whether or not you think that Hillary Clinton can win, or if it will affect her in achieving the nomination. But I absolutely cannot see that happening. As you guys move forward into listening to the Democratic primaries, and even the present elections, I want you guys to keep a few things in mind. I want you guys to look forward to what you want in a presidential candidate, what you think it takes to win, and what happens if your choice doesn't. Dan? Okay, 450. Okay. So nervous. <laughs> Stay up there. Stay up there for some feedback. Hands out of your pocket. Okay, we're here. Yes, sir. Um, Stand up. Say your name. I'm Sheehan. Hi, Sheehan. Um, I felt like the supporting points didn't, or you didn't do enough to tie the supporting points directly back to the question. To the thesis. To the thesis. Oh, thank you. Yes. That was, um, that was supposed to say what you like. I don't think you like that. Oh, but, um, do what do you like? <laughs> Hi, my name is Jasmine. Hi, Hi Jasmine. Jasmine. I thought you did an excellent job, and props to you for going on the first day. And um, you had a lot of information. It showed that you knew what you were talking about, and um, I think you did a great job. Maybe just not so much swing, because that was a little distracting. Yeah. But other Sorry. than that... <laughs> Okay, thank you, Jasmine. Yeah, Cody, uh, we'll talk about that first. When you watch yourself tonight on YouTube, <laughs> you're going to see that you're doing this constantly. Yeah. And the solution is plant your feet wider than your shoulders and become a tripod and, and flex your legs so you can't sway. And if you need to walk, if, that, if that's too much for you, you can walk three times. My first reason, my second reason they won't use it, the third reason they won't use it, back to center. Yeah, I expected you walking if the whole that, time. If that helps you, yeah. <laughs> but, but what I sense you want to do is pace. Mm -hmm. But more back to the major problem with um, the speech, which is following the prompt. You started with a rhetorical question. What do you look for in a leader? Is it someone progressive, strong, and honest? So I'm looking for a tie back to progressive, strong, and honest, and I don't get that. Okay. You understand? Yeah. So, uh, and I would like you to be as specific as your opening was in your tie back, and I think that um, the honesty thing is, you know, the trustworthy thing has always been Hillary's problem. You know, it's from Whitewater to the, the white, you know, from everything. everything. It's just, oh, another, another Hillary Clinton, the travel office. It just goes on. It doesn't stop. Benghazi, it doesn't stop. And uh, there's just always questions about Hillary Clinton. And this is reflected in the polls. But let me get you. Let me let me talk about um, first about the structure, and then I'll talk about the content. Okay. So the structure. Your thesis was my answer is no. That the email panel will not play a major role in the Democratic primaries. Now your thesis is basically the Democrats won't use this against her, right? <laughs> Uh, that that would be suicide or something. It would it would give Republicans, uh, you know, the uh, upper hand. What you fail to acknowledge in the holistic sense of it is, you know, the Republicans are holding hearings and things are going on in the press, and the New York Times is running stuff daily, and the Wall Street Journal is printing, you know, lists of Hillary's lies when it comes to the email scandal. And there's a lot of coverage on this from her press conference to now, uh, things that she's not been truthful about, about the email scandal. So uh, I think that, 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 that sort of is problematic. So when you tell us that my answer is no, and then you had a good significance statement, I'll give you that, but... When you gave reason one, reason two, and reason three, you didn't tie it to your thesis statement. 
and you needed to do that more. Reason one why they won't be used in the Democratic primary is succinctly. Oh. Reason two is succinctly. Reason three that won't be used in the Democratic primary is succinctly. And then, in summary, here's why it won't be, conclusion and then tieback. You had the parts here, but you didn't quite follow them. As for the content of your analysis, let me, I don't want to completely, I liked your speech, I like your speaking style, I like, I think you're a sincere speaker. I didn't see any research here. I didn't see a single citation, and there's a lot out there. Yeah. There's a lot yeah, of information out there. I had it originally in like a, uh, like yeah. a work cited like number kind of thing format, and then I didn't bring that. But I'm looking for each of the major points in your main body to have one or two pieces of evidence. And we're going to have a library lecture where we're going to learn how to surf the deep internet and quote those things. But... I'm really looking, you know, you, uh, you, you talked about the 75 million and the 20%, but we don't get a citation on that. And those are called arguments from authority, right? Mm -hmm. And remember, we, we, in making a speech sticky, we want it to be credible. And that's one of the things that helps make it credible. Finally, we wanted something to, we want to always put something unexpected in our speeches that people aren't expecting that will grab and draw them in and make them want to listen. What was unexpected in this speech? What did you design into this that was unexpected? That, you know, despite that she has her issues, she still uh -huh. is probably going to come up and win the, the nomination. Democratic nomination. Yeah, uh -huh. even though this is such a controversial issue with her honesty mm -hmm. that, you know... Her other positives will her overcome other positives us. if she has some. We'll overcome her. Okay. We'll overcome her negatives. Okay, good. Let me just uh, while let me do we have another volunteer to go up next? I don't have an outline, but I'd be happy to see. Well, what do you? I can make my outline real fast. You can make an outline real fast. Okay. Who who wants to be, who does have an outline that wants to speak next? Mr. Hat here. I don't have an outline. Oh, a tragedy. Okay. Um, okay. While you're making your outline. Let's throw this open to the class for some help from some poli sci majors or anybody else. You buy his analysis, the Dems are not going to use it, or it's not going to be an issue in the Democratic primary. That the you know email gate is going to go away. Yes, please. I agree with Cody in that. Oh, sorry. Can you lose the hat? <coughs> sure. Thank you. I'm Kai. Hi, Kai. And I agree, with, I agree with Cody in that I don't think this email scandal is going to play a major role. And um, I do think that like her character is going to be the main issue in selection, um, at least on the Democratic side. And um, Bernie's problem right now is a lot of people don't know him. And Hillary might be able to overcome that because she has so much financial support built up over the year that she can just flood advertising for herself and spread her name and mm -hmm. kind of just drown Bernie Sanders out. But I think okay. Bernie, if he can get his name out to people, has a chance of winning this election. Interesting. <coughs> uh, we, we haven't mentioned Joe, run Joe Biden. No. Uh, no, he's not going to do it, and you think that's out of the question. I see a hand in the rear. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Raymond. Hi, Hi Raymond. Raymond. I agree with Cody, um, especially for this, um, given the wording of this, uh, in the Democratic... The, narr the narrowness of yeah. it, yeah. Given the Democratic primaries, I agree with the point that they wouldn't use it because they give, um, they give, uh, I guess, uh, more ammo for uh, the Republicans, but regardless of if they use it in the Democratic primaries, I think the Republicans will use it against her, regardless of if they use right. it against her. Right. You know it's coming. Yeah. And uh, it's, you know it's coming, and it's going to go to... it's. You talk about her good character, but what, you know, we talked about already what goes into credibility. We, 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 hopefully we talked about this last week, those three components, right? Trustworthiness, expert, and dynamism. There's no question that Hillary has the expertness going in her credential bag, right? She's done it there, Secretary of State, been the First Lady, done the New York Senator bit. 
she's pretty qualified. You know, Yale Law School, mm. she's a pedigree. Mm. But wow, dynamism, she's working on it now. I see she's going on Jimmy Fallon and, you know, humiliating herself and playing little games and showing she's regular. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just sad, but, you know, I sad that all the politicians are doing that. But, and, but finally, the trustworthiness is tricky on her because uh, she's got a long history of... Uh, of uh, it reminds me a lot of this politician, some of you probably haven't even heard of, named Richard Nixon. He used to call him Tricky Dick because he was in so many tricky little uh, scandals and uh, problems he bought. He got his wife a fur coat and a little dog named Checkers and all this stuff. And he, they, they, he got the name Tricky Dick because no one trusted him. Uh, and Hillary has, a, Hillary has an honesty and trustworthiness problem. And it shows it in the polls. And this is going to be fed if there's more evidence, as the New York Times suggests there is, that she wasn't truthful, and if you do a two-month gap, and if they manage to resurrect what's really on that stupid thing that's been erased, that's trouble. Any other comments before we go on? Yes, please. Um, uh, hi, I'm Yoshi. Uh, what's your name? Yoshi. Like Yoshi? Hi, <laughs> um, I took a poli sci class, and um, we learned about how like political scandals don't really affect long term outcomes, mm -hmm. um, because like we saw like how many news stories were like posted about a scandal, and it's only like, <coughs> right when it happens, and after that, people just slowly stop talking about it, and it just doesn't mm -hmm. affect people's opinions over time. So. Yeah. So, I, so you think she's you think she's oh, going to be okay? Yeah, she's going to survive. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see. Unless, what if the Republicans can keep it alive? Then maybe maybe that you. maybe that quality maybe that generalization won't get through. There's a new hand in the back. I'll give you the last word, sir. Um, Jeremy. I was Hi, Jeremy. Though, uh, with uh, and pertains to Hillary's uh, situation, how her husband's prior dishonesty might also kind of impact America's weariness towards like, the family. You know what I mean? A bunch of liars. Monica Lewinsky, <laughs> the blue draft. Right. She just yeah. did a TED Talk, by the way. Mm -hmm. Monica Lewinsky. Really? Mm -hmm. She just did a TED Talk. What was the topic? Her scandal. The blue draft. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm Kai. Um, Hi, Kai. I, I don't really think that what the Republicans are going to think really matters in the Democratic primaries. Um, just because, like, I don't listen to Republican news like for the Democratic primaries. Like, right. nationally, it might have an effect if it were happening like during the elections, national elections. Mm -hmm. But during the Democratic primaries, I don't think that this um, email scandal can be used by the Republicans. Okay. To harm Hillary. Okay, we'll see. Uh, my own, I, might, I said you get the last word. My only comment is there's a bunch of reporters at the Washington Post and the New York Times and the, New, and the Wall Street Journal that are furrowing away at this. So it's going to get some news coverage. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Rock and roll. A rough outline. Very good. You, you want to please?
Okay. She stands before you managing attention. She's reading. Communicating respect non-verbally. Finding friendly eyes near the front and the center. He's about to address the question, are earthquakes due to fracking an acceptable price to pay for cheap natural gas? Hi, my name's Sheehan Parker. Hi, Hi. Sheehan. I'd like to bring us back to the time in 1906 when an earthquake struck the northern part of, the United, or the northern part of California. It was known as the San Francisco earthquake because after the earthquake destroyed a number of buildings, it also severed gas lines in San Francisco. Together, the earthquake and the fire that ensued from the severed gas lines destroyed 80% of San Francisco. In 1906, this was thought to be an act of God, and there was nothing that the people could do, no option that they had, no choice that they had to make. Today, however, earthquakes continue to strike the United States, and now, in some cases, we do have an option to make, and we are faced with the question, are earthquakes due to fracking an acceptable, an acceptable price to pay for, the, for cheap natural gas? I will propose that the answer to this question is no. These earthquakes are not an acceptable price to pay. The significance of this question, not least the 3.8 million people who live in the state of Oklahoma, their, the things that they own, their houses, their cars, and most importantly their lives, plus the millions of people who live in the greater region in which these earthquakes are affecting them. For the most part, however, I will be speaking about the earthquakes that are occurring in Oklahoma due to this new type of uh, natural, natural gas mining known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking, in which miners put, weight, put water and wastewater pumped into the, into the tectonic plates so that they can release natural gas and thus, use it for, and thus we can use it. This question, uh, this question I'd like to analyze it. I'd like to analyze for a second uh, before I jump into the points which uh, I believe will show that the answer to the question is no. This is a cost-benefit question. We're being asked to weigh the cost of earthquakes due to fracking with the benefit of the so-called cheap natural gas that we get as a result. Uh, from 2008, when fracking was not as common, to 2012, when fracking has become much more common, the price of natural gas has changed. According to Investopedia, in an article from August 2014, the price for residential natural gas has fallen from, from roughly, no, has fallen from $13.89 for a thousand, for a thousand pounds of natural gas to $10.33. That's roughly a 25% fall in the price of natural gas. So as we continue to analyze the costs of these earthquakes, keep in mind that that is what we should be comparing these costs to. I will be talking about three costs of these earthquakes. First is the frequency with which these earthquakes occur. Second is the damage that these earthquakes cause in the area. And third is the potential for the increase and continued damage that these earthquakes will cause in the future. First, these earthquakes' frequency. In the mid-continent of the United States, specifically the state of Oklahoma, earthquakes before 2009 were a very rare occurrence. Certainly, the area is not known for earthquakes like we are here in California. However, according to a, Bloom a Bloomberg News article from June of this year, these earthquakes have increased from 2009 to now at a rate of 6,000% increase. Now, according to the United States Geological Service, there are more earthquakes of a magnitude of three every year in Oklahoma than there are in California. This is the frequency that we're discussing, and this is the frequency we need to keep in mind when comparing it to this cheap natural gas. The second, or the second reason that we should answer no to this question is that the damage that is the damage that these earthquakes incur. According to local news organization Oklahoma OK9, from reports taken throughout this summer, there have been damage from earthquakes, which has caused blackouts in Paint County, which has caused damage to schools in Crescent County, and Crescent County School District has considered having to build new schoolhouses because of this damage. And finally, referring to the same Bloomberg News uh, article cited earlier, there has been physical harm, such as in the case of Sandra Ladry, who, is, who experienced physical harm to her legs and knees after bricks fell on her while watching TV with her family uh, during one of these earthquakes. Fi and finally, the third reason that I believe we should finally the third reason that I believe we should answer no to this question is that it poses a problem that will only increase in the future. 
According to a report by, uh, by a geologist with the last name Harnedi, reported on ocali.com, uh, another Oklahoma-based news organization, the injection, the injection related earthquakes that are being caused by this fracking pose a threat to reactivate the Guthrie Langston Stillwater, uh, the Stillwater Tectonic Ridge, which exists in Oklahoma and for many years has been inactive. He, he reports that if this is reactivated by these injection related earthquakes, the ridge <coughs> has the potential of creating a more than 5.0 magnitude earthquake every week in the region. Right now, we're looking at earthquakes of more than three for hundreds of times a year, but with an earthquake increasing to the magnitude of more than five, we're becoming ever closer to that 7.8 magnitude earthquake which tore down San Francisco in 1906. In summary, these are the three things that we're going to hold against the, the benefit of this so-called cheap natural gas. First, earthquakes are occurring 6,000% times more frequently in Oklahoma than they were before the introduction of fracking. Secondly, they're causing damage to property, they're causing damage to the economic ability with widespread uh, blackouts, and they're causing damage to the people who live in Oklahoma. And third, it's going to continue to cause damage with the potential of causing quite a bit more damage if it reactivates the ridge uh, on, the, on, on which the state sits. And that's why we, we must conclude, unlike the people in San Francisco who had no option, who didn't have the choice that we're given today, we must and we ought to conclude that it is an unacceptable price to pay for this 25% decrease in the cost of natural gas to put these millions and millions of people's lives at risk, to put their property at risk, and ultimately uh, for our own selfish benefit. And for these reasons, I urge you uh, to answer the negation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Where are we? Here! You Me? did it already? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Bridget. Hi, hey, Bridget. Bridget. Um, I really liked your energy. Like, you're talking fast, but in a way it kind of made you have to pay attention more and, like, keep up with you. Mm -hmm. So I like that. You also used a lot of really good sources. And I thought the structure of your speech was really wonderful. Yeah, it was easy to follow. You followed the seven-part outline. Great. Yeah. The speed uh, could be varied and still get the same effect. You had uh, 30 seconds, so. <clears throat> improvement. What would you like to see him do differently that would improve his speech next time? Um, hi, my name's Raymond. Hi. Uh, What's your name? Raymond. Hi, Raymond. Um, really good job overall. Uh, your structure was easy to follow. Um, one thing I would go is um, the I guess, um, to offer counter um, points to um, your own argument, so you, um, counter points to your own argument, so you can go against them, I guess. Um, I don't know how to phrase that better, but like, um, like the benefits of cheap natural gas and why those don't outweigh the cost of gas. Okay, more benefits to cheap natural gas in the speech? Mm hmm. Hmm. All right. Shin, um, really a fine job. Uh, you're very fluent, very smart. Uh, you know how to make an argument, and you put it together nicely. I'd like to see you do this without notes. Can you trust your memory next time? I hope so. Yeah, uh, that would be good. Um, let's talk about uh, the structure and then the content. Your intro, you started with a San Francisco earthquake. What was the magnitude of that? It was at 8.3, was 7. that right? 7.8. 7.8, okay. And um, so we're getting up there with some of these Oklahoma quakes, right? Is that your point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you tied, you notice you tied back to the San Francisco quake in the end. So we understood that concept of the bookends nicely. You very nicely had a interesting smooth segue into the question which you stated clearly and you stated your answer which was uh, no and uh, you had a significant statement and uh, we didn't get your preview till a while later but that's okay um, make your preview a little clearer, just with your voice, and I'm going to argue three reasons, three things, so that 
we know that that is uh, coming. Um, your body was good. It was consistent. All the arguments were good. You fully cited your sources with dates. They were all recent dates. That was excellent. Um, you had a good summary. Your conclusion and tieback were all good. Let's talk about the content for a minute. Um, on the issue of uh, you, you chose a very uh, particular area and you were careful not to generalize and to say we should ban fracking everywhere. You, you just pointed out that there have been problems in Oklahoma. And so uh, the natural thing that people that are thinking about, well, God, this means we should ban fracking in Oklahoma or something. Or people that see those silly movies about the gas coming out of the faucet, they go, we, we need to get rid of fracking completely. There are other places where they haven't had these problems, and so that's, that's the counterpoint. And I don't know whether you want to introduce this in the speech. I don't think so. Mm. But I think you uh, really did a really excellent job of making the case in Oklahoma. Now, do you think Oklahoma is an outlier, typical, atypical, or do you, did you in your research sort of uh, find a few other earthquakes around, or a few in Texas, hardly any up in North Dakota, you know, um, I found that few in Canada? The region of the mid-continent of the United States, uh, it was pretty common, but because of, um, because of my third point, the, the findings that pointed particularly to the to the fault line in Oklahoma. Yeah. I decided to narrow in uh, into that yeah. region. I thought that was good, especially that big fault line that's going to get bigger. Mm -hmm. Let's open this up to the group. Anybody have some conceptual analysis, either on his thesis, his evidence, or his reasoning that you would like to add, agree with, or take issue with on his speech? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Kai. Hi, and Kai. I, and I don't really have any issue with what Sheehan said. Um, I just feel like I really love like your delivery and your tone and like everything that your voice did. I just feel like your body would have been a better match if you changed like up your stance, maybe like and like use your arms a little bit to emphasize your points. Because I heard your like if I close my eyes and hear your speech, I can literally see your body like emphasizing like your mm -hmm. words. You know, and um, just to have some congruence with that would be really nice. Yeah. Those are good points. Let me teach you to walk, okay? Um, no, I know the. Do you yeah, know, know, know the drill? The, do you know the drill of the way to walk three times? You walk okay. with your point. You walk with your point. So let's see you walk with your first point. Would be um, the first reason that we should. Where's my first point? <laughs> Um, the the first cost of earth the first cost of earthquakes that we need to take into account is the Wait, stop 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 now I hope you're all looking at his feet did you notice how he walked he walked he walked to the left and he stepped with his left foot first you do not cross when you walk you step with your left foot first when you're walking left. You step with your right foot when you're walking right. That way you don't do this kind of thing. Okay? Okay, so your second point, he steps left. My second two, point and he's two, is and he keeps it cheated forward. See? He doesn't turn his body away from the audience. So he's an old pro. Okay, good. Yeah. And then back to center. So that's good. Anybody else have any comments on fracking? Yes, please. I'm Egon. I'm Egon. I'm Egon. I'm Egon. Like, you know, like everyone said, it was, great. It was really, just really, really good. Um, the only thing I would probably say is, I mean, it was good because your, your preparation was good, your delivery was good, and it was, it was just what I wanted to hear, and I agree, like, wholeheartedly. I would probably say if you really wanted to bring it home for me, it would be 
bring a solution, right? Because we de people definitely want cheap natural gas. I mean, mm -hmm. we're using less coal now and burning gas instead, and we all want electricity. So nobody wants to pay more for electricity. People are already upset that price electricity prices are going up. Uh, a solution or what we could do about it really tied up. Yeah, true, but you know, to be intellectually fair, it wasn't really asked in this question. But yeah, I also really want to talk about environmental issues associated with fracking. But right, and then I looked at the question and I was like, oh, I can't do that. Yeah, it's not. It's not in the question. You have to have the discipline not to digress. Thank you very much, Ian. Very good job. Okay, we have another volunteer. I need to call on someone, huh? <laughs> okay, well, I'll just run my finger down the list, to be fair. Did I hear a volunteer back there? It's okay, we're all, remember, strawberries ripen at a different rate doesn't mean you're <laughs> bad because you're ripening a little slower. Maybe I'll show you uh, somebody in this class that was chosen graduation speaker as an inspiration for, for a break. You need a little more inspiration? She was great, all the little great, nice, and fantastic. We're all great. We just Okay, has the roll sheet circulated? Yes. Where is it? Mm -hmm. To the right. To the right. Great, thank you. Okay, let me uh, randomly pick somebody so they can be preparing. Kai! <laughs>
Tennis, Caitlin Ray. What's your student? She was, a, she was my student. She was a student in this very class. Uh, okay. So First, I'd like to bring to the stage from women's tennis, loud. Caitlin Ray. A little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. Good evening, everyone. I'm incredibly honored to have been given the opportunity to speak with you tonight. First, I want to thank our athletic director, Dan Guerrero, Dr. Christina Rivera, and every member of the, of the faculty and staff within the UCLA Athletic Department for the support and long hours that you've invested in making our student athlete experience so special. We would not be in this position without you. I begin with a moment that I shared with my father shortly before I arrived to college that has profoundly impacted my experience here. He said, Caitlin, I have one and only one thing to say to you. Make sure when you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, the person staring back at you is you, not the person anyone else in this world wants you to be. This world can take our physical gifts and attributes. It can strip us of things. But my father taught me that it cannot touch our convictions, our integrity, our moral compass, and our character. The four things that have been tested enormously by the university experience in which every temptation and distraction has been thrown at us. For me, the true Caitlin Ray is the girl who chose as a freshman to start her tradition of bringing a book into the ice bath uh, and reading during those 10 minutes of torture. This not only meant that I forfeited the opportunity to make small talk with good-looking male athletes and thus boost my social capital, but it also made me the frequent target of friendly ridicule, such as, hey, what's up, bookworm? So, while the infamous stack of flashcards that I carry around may have resulted in a slightly less robust social calendar. That is who I am. It is different for us all. But the key is having the courage to be you, whatever that may look like, day in and day out. Those you lose along the way because you chose not to conform will at the very least respect you, which is something to which momentary popularity simply pales in comparison. May we continue to have the courage to be different. I now move to the final theme that I wish to leave with you tonight. Namely, what, do we want, what legacy do we want to leave to this world? What is it that we truly want to be remembered for? I borrow from New York Times journalist David Brooks when I say, a distinction must be drawn between spending your life, building your resume, and building your eulogy. Records and championships win temporary accolades and admiration 
but they certainly do not define us, and they are not meant to serve as the founda foundational elements of who we are, the person we want our family members and friends to remember when our time is up. The traits that my father taught me to fight to preserve in the mirror each morning are not coincidentally the same elements on which a legacy that we can be proud of is built. As athletes, it will be our tendency to bring the same qualities that made us great in our respective sports, the ability to work, to grind, to embrace pain, to our future endeavors. But we must also strike a balance. After all, the next game, the next play, was never guaranteed. And neither is 40 years from now, 20 years from now, or even tomorrow. So let us not spend all of our time tirelessly pursuing resume boosters and notches on the belt that we neglect to build our legacy. Character combined with a genuine heart and the desire to do the right thing and serve others will ultimately prove far more lasting than anything we attain in the professional or athletic arenas. To every mother, every father, every grandparent, every brother, every sister, aunt, uncle, coach, former coach, influential professors, mentors, teammates, and friends here in the audience today and watching from afar. We thank you for your support, your sacrifices, your inspiration, and your unconditional love. You have taught us right from wrong. You have showed us what it means to get up every day and sacrifice for the people you love, and you prepared us to succeed at UCLA. I now challenge myself and the extraordinary group of men and women that sit before me to be like the man in the arena to whom President Theodore Roosevelt referred, who, quote, spins himself in a worthy cause who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. This university has taught us to dare greatly. In doing so, let us first never forget what our parents taught us. Speak with conviction. Maintain your integrity. And above all, be yourself. Let us also not forget, as employers are reading our resumes, that someday the world will be reading our eulogies. What will yours say? Thank you so much. speech for a young lady like this to uh, do in front of the athletic department, which is all about rah-rah, let's get another national championship. Uh, so I thought, that, I thought that was fairly brave of her to do it in that environment, too. Any other comments? 
Yes, please. I, uh, I think she did a good job of letting Stand up, please. <coughs> Jeremy? I think she did a good job of, uh, of uh, letting us all like, kind of um, connect with her when she brought the story about her dad. I mean, you know, we all have a, a we all have role a father, yeah. figure that you know, we look to and have those kind of interactions with. So yeah. I felt like not only did it make her speech more relatable, it made her more personal as a person, as just like a speaker in general. Right. And so it really allowed us to kind of get behind what she was saying. Right. And I think that uh, she talked about the price she paid for being herself, for being a bookworm. She graduated, even though she was on the tennis team, she graduated with a free nine. She was a comm studies major. Uh, she was athlete of the year with uh, her academic athlete of the year. Uh, so she was a certain as she carried these flashcards around that she walked between classes and to memorize her points. So she was, you know, really um, driven to excellence and didn't want to waste a moment. But that was her being herself. And so she used herself as an example, which I thought was pretty endearing. Right. So another story about herself and going into the uh, whatever. Is there any athletes in here? No, what, what, what is this, the cold room or something? You go into the cold room after you work out? Well, the ice bath. The ice bath. The ice bath. The ice bath. Okay, great. <laughs> you get an ice bath after you work out. Okay, great. Okay, are we ready? Sure. Okay, this is going to be this is going to be interesting because I'm on red, but I'm going to try to make your speech and see if we can get it in. Okay, so it may quit and we may have to put in another battery, but that'll be life. I think we'll make it because I usually get an hour twenty on this battery. Okay. Okay, we're about to hear from Kai on the question, should the international community be wary of the new Chinese-founded Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, also known as AIIB? Yep. Uh, Translated from Chinese, that means, hello, my name is Ride the Wind, and my English name is Kai, and I don't like to give speeches that much. <laughs> However, the topic that I'm going to be speaking on today is of such great importance to everyone here that I feel I should at least put some effort in to try to shed some light on the topic. Um, if you lend me your ears for seven minutes, you will get to learn about the future of diplomacy between the U.S. and China and also learn about the very real economic power struggle that is occurring between our two worlds right now. Therefore, the question I'll be addressing today is, should the international community be wary of the new Chinese-founded Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? It's a mouthful. I'll just call it a. Okay, so, oh, um, my answer to this question is no, we should not be wary. And I will give you three reasons supporting my answer. The first reason why we should not be wary of the Abe is because the Abe is an intrinsically benevolent undertaking. It's composed of 57 nations with the main goal of improving the infrastructure of low-income to middle-income Asian countries. This would mean new roads, more efficient power, safer buildings, and better public transportation. And it's all going to be backed by the $100 billion of startup capital in the Abe currently. Also, I feel very strongly about this personally because my grandma lives in China and I got uh, the chance to go back to see her this summer. And ironically, as she's gotten older, she's gotten more and more active. She loves to go out in the morning, walk on the street, take public transportation. So of course, I would personally feel safer if I knew programs existed that ensured that she was walking on smoother roads and that the buildings she lived in were safer and cleaner. Now, it is possible that the new Abe will use its influence to affect 
um, internationally and domestic policy. Uh, Jing Li Chun, uh, president of the president of Abe, expects that there will be no kind of bureaucracy at the bank. He said that we must take anti-corruption as one of the most important objectives because the shareholders are the governments of the different countries and uh, we must take every effort not to misplace their um, taxpayers' money just because that's the right thing to do. Um, so for now, I think that the possible benefits of the AIM um, overpower the possible re repercussions later on. Now, moving on to the second reason. Um, the second reason why we should not be wary of the establishment of the AIM is because the Chinese people don't want world supremacy or uh, domination. Over the summer, I went to China for a month, and um, I got to talk with my dad, who's a professor at Beidou University, one of the two um, most prestigious universities in China. And I also got to converse with other professors at Tsinghua University, the other very prestigious Chinese university. And I asked them, what, what do the Chinese people want for the future? And um, his response was, peace. That blew my mind. And um, they also said that the consensus among their colleagues and the younger generation was that everybody loved America and that peace would be the best option for the future. Families in China have nieces, nephews, daughters, sons over here. And um, peace would be the best to guarantee their safety and also the economic viability of both countries. Um, therefore, I believe that if we join Abe and extend a hand first 